We asked today's guest expert, David Stockman, former U.S. congressman and Wall Street executive, what's the biggest risk to markets today? His answer, simple, just three things, the Fed, the Fed, and the Fed. To find out why he said this, stick around and watch this video. But before you do, take a second and click on the like button below. It helps us continue the run of amazing expert guests that we've had on this program, because the more likes these videos get, the more big names we're able to attract on the program. And now, let's get started with today's market update featuring David Stockman. Everybody, Adam Taggart here from peakprosperity.com, welcoming you back to another week of trying to make sense of these markets. I'm very excited about today's guest expert. Um, he's been a friend of Peak Prosperity's for many years. We're huge fans of his. It's David Stockman. David almost needs no introduction, uh, but if you're unfamiliar with him, the quick backstory is uh, he was a uh, congressman, a U.S. representative from Michigan back in the late 70s, and then caught the eye of a new president, uh, Ronald Reagan, who made David his head of uh, uh, dire the director for the Office of Management and Budget, which was a cabinet position under Reagan, and uh, that made David the youngest cabinet member of the 20th century. He's a pretty sharp guy. Uh, after his time in D.C., he then went uh, to Wall Street, worked for uh, as an investment banker uh, uh, at Solomon Brothers for a while, and then became one of the early partners at the private equity firm Blackstone. So I like to refer to David as one of the true insider insiders. Um, he knows the, the institutions that run uh, Capitol Hill and Wall Street, and he knows the actual people running those institutions. So there's really nobody who can give us a, a better inside perspective, in my opinion, uh, than, than David Stockman. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, happy to be with you, Adam. And uh, that was a very flattering introduction. Some people might say I've never held a steady job in my <laughs> whole life because I've moved from Washington uh, to uh, Wall Street and beyond. But uh, I think it gave me a certain perspective that, um, you know, not too many people have, seeing both the sausage factory down there and what they grind out of it, and a, a market today that seems to be totally dependent on what they're doing uh, on the banks of the Potomac, uh, particularly uh, in the Eccles building, uh, and now as well uh, as uh, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. In other words, you know, the market today doesn't look at the economy, as far as I'm concerned. It basically looks at Washington to see how much stimulus and of what type and how soon and, and how much uh, and when are you going to do more uh, coming at us. Uh, you know, I would say if this were a real market, uh, it uh, has kind of jumped the shark uh, straight into fantasy land. But, you know, it isn't what we have today. Uh, you just think of where we are. Uh, the Fed, based on yesterday's announcement and everything that's gone before, is well on its way to a $10 trillion balance sheet. You know, they're, they're adding a billion for a year at an annual rate. They say they will do that indefinitely until they have an economy that they like, which in my view we're never going to get to. More importantly, they said they're going to keep the interest rate uh, pinned on the zero uh, bound uh, till 2024. Now let's think of the implication of that. It was in February 2008 that the, was the last time that the inflation rate was actually slightly higher than the federal funds rate. And over the next 152 months, there have only been seven months in which there was a positive real money market rate most of the time, it's been way, way underwater, and now they're going to extend that for another three plus years. You're going to have 17 years straight, consecutive, of negative real money market rates. That does nothing for the real economy. Uh, business doesn't finance its inventory in the money market. Uh, you know, a household doesn't buy a new car or borrow to buy a new car, a washing machine, or even a trip to Disneyland in the money market. The money market is basically what services uh, Wall Street traders and dealers and speculators and gamblers. And when you make uh, you know, money essentially uh, free or negative in real terms, uh, you're just fueling um, you know, the mother of all financial speculations. And, and I think that's where we are today. And I think the proof of it actually probably came this morning on Bubble Vision when even Jim Cramer, of all people, was lamenting the lack of discipline in the IPO market 
and was pointing out that there are now 30 companies trading at 30 times or more sales. We're not talking about net income or something uh, that measures value, but 30 times sales. Uh, that Zoom, which we happen uh, to be accessing at the moment, is trading at 50 times sales. And then, of course, the great uh, IPO uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, a warning bell of the era, uh, uh, Snowflake yesterday reached 100 times sales. And, of course, those aren't just, uh, you know, minor aberrations way over on the margin of the market. A little while ago, or not too long ago, we had, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, Tesla trading at 450 billion of market cap which was more than all the auto companies in the world who have been around for 100 years or more, and some of them are pretty damn good, like Porsche uh, or Mercedes or Toyota, plus all the other uh, also rands. Um, or we have a situation today where, you know, if you look at even the S&P 500, which is supposed to be the broad market, you know, the stable anchor of the whole system, uh, if we look at LTM earnings uh, through June, latest 12 months, on a gap basis, the kind of earnings that you don't go to jail for if you're a CEO and a CFO when you file with the SEC, were $65 a share. And even if you take the so-called X items or operating earnings that Wall Street loves to pick apart uh, out of uh, the uh, filings and, you know, set aside any one-timers, that can include about anything, it's $125 a share. So either way, the market is trading somewhere between 27 times and 52 times trailing earnings in an environment that we've never been in before, in which the government is basically going off the deep end, <laughs> shut down the economy, what I call lockdown nation. And uh, you know, here we are trading at these uh, nosebleed levels and in, in an economic situation that we've never been before. The 30%, by the way, 31% that we had in Q2 was actually, and I checked this out, uh, a worse decline on a quarterly basis than any quarter in 1930 through 1932 at the very dark, deep bottom of the Great uh, Depression. So uh, we also, you know, this week had some more data that I think confirms the case that there's really no V uh, kind of uh, recovery snapback in, in sight. But I would just cite the industrial production in index. That's the heart of the economy. That's manufacturing. It's the entire energy uh, and mining sector. It's all of the uh, utility sector. Uh, it, it was uh, it posted uh, in August after we've had three or four months of so-called uh, rebound at the same level first crossed in 206. In other words, we, we've been set back uh, 14 years uh, in terms of where we are in industrial production. And if you look at manufacturing, which after all sooner or later provides the real margin of value added in an economy, uh, it was at April 204 levels, so that's, uh, you know, we're still 16 years behind uh, where we were that long ago. Now, these are just, you know, some of the indicators that obviously tell you the stock market is high on the Fed's, uh, you know, unending uh, liquidity and financial repression and uh, bond buying, and it's totally disconnected from the real world economy that was already, you know, laboring under 77 trillion of public and private debt before the COVID thing hit in March uh, and is now, uh, you know, uh, in very serious uh, uh, disrepair and danger as a result of the impact uh, that we've had uh, uh, ever since uh, March. All right. Well, David, you just sort of blew through, I think, my first questions, one through seven, that I had, okay. <laughs> but great job. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of people on this program over the past couple of months that we've been, you know, sort of wrestling with this question of um, uh, how, how worried should we be about where markets are right now? Because, of course, many people love it when the markets go up month after month after month, right? Um, and uh, virtually to, you know, a unanimous uh, vote, uh, everyone that we've had on has brought their own perspective as to why things are concerning 
today. Um, you know, we've had people from a technical side, from a fundamental side. Uh, we did have a Fed uh, analyst, uh, Daniel DiMartino Booth, weigh in on, on the Fed policy side. Um, but I think your perspective carries the most weight with me because of your history with the machinery, the mechanics, and the people who have been running this economy and running these markets over the past, you know, 50 years. So, um, 40, 50 years. So, um, it, it, it really, uh, that to me really hits home and says, look, if a guy like David Stockman is, is um, you know, using words to the level that you are um, to wake people up, it means we really do have a big problem here. Now, you wrote a book uh, a few years ago called The Great Deformation, and I presume that what we're seeing here and, and all the examples that you're listing are examples of what you get during a crazy deformation, um, where you can have uh, prices, you know, continue to get to stratospheric levels, even when the underlying fundamentals, the underlying economic activity, you know, just takes like a mortal gut wound. Um, you just talked about the negative 31% Q2 GDP drop. Um, you know, this, this elephant has been shot and is largely bleeding out to death, but it doesn't know it yet. And it's still just trampling everybody in its path here. Yeah. So my question for you is, is there any way out of this beyond, um, either letting just the system, you know, collapse of its own weight, which I don't think any politician or policymaker is going to going to let happen under their watch. Uh, so that would be deflation. Um, so it's either that or it's it's just inflating everything away where we're, we're you know, nominally, uh, you know, supporting our debts and, and, uh, and whatnot, but we're just destroying the purchasing power of our currency in the process. Or I guess there's a third option, which is before either of those happens in totality, there just might be civil unrest of the, the size where people just say, look, this isn't working. There's a very small pocket of people that are getting incredibly rich at this while the rest of us are getting thrown under the bus. We're going to grab our torches and pitchforks and just break the system. So is there any way out of this besides one of those three? Well, I think uh, you've exhausted the possibilities, but I would say it has gone so far uh, now, uh, both at the Fed level and also on the fiscal front. I mean, uh, it's crazy. This year, um, and the fiscal year is almost over, uh, talking about FY 2020, we're going to end up spending $6.6 trillion and taking in less than half of that in revenue. So this is banana republic finance, where you fund 50% of your budget by borrowing uh, or going to, to, you know, to the bond market. Now, so the question is, uh, I don't see any way of changing the direction because, you know, they, they never were all that fastidious as a fiscal matter on Capitol Hill, but at once upon a time when I was there in Congress or even during the Reagan era, there was a deathly fear of uh, the so-called bond vigilantes or of rising interest rates or what we used to call crowding out. If the federal government was borrowing too much, uh, ultimately uh, there was going to be rising interest rates that would hit homeowners and businesses that wanted to borrow and invest and expand. And so therefore it kept a lid on things. But since 1987 and what I call the Greenspan era of whatever you want to call it, wealth effects uh, monetary policy or Keynesian monetary policy, um, the, the Fed has made it so easy by this massive repression of interest rates to finance uh, almost unlimited deficits that no one cares anymore. And so, you know, we're just burying uh, the country in, in uh, debt. Uh, at the end of uh, this fiscal year, uh, you know, we'll have uh, debt that's equal to about 145% of GDP, uh, a place that we've never been before. So. The question is, how do you get out of that uh, vicious circle of easy money <laughs> encouraging, uh, you know, just the most fantastic, reckless uh, fiscal policies imaginable? The answer is, I think we need a thundering shock because the one thing in all those years I learned about Washington is that it has an amazing capacity to fall into groupthink and uh, lose track of history and context. And that's the problem we have today. The group think on Capitol Hill is, well, let's not worry about it now. The deficit, deficit's a problem for the future. And at the Fed, they're so caught up in a exaggerated notion of their powers that uh, they're doing things that are just you know, irrational financially. How could they be saying there's too little inflation 
when you know take a good measure of inflation which is the 60 or yeah the 16 percent trending cpi i like to use that because it takes out the high and low uh just one month at a time and so therefore you get the volatility out of the index but you cover the whole market basket of goods and services well they went to uh you know inflation targeting so-called in january uh, uh 2012 2012 and if you look at the trending CPI in August, it represents uh, a 2.15% uh, compound gain uh, in the price index over the period since then. In other words, all this time that they've been whining about too little inflation, they've been over the target if you measure it correctly. And of course, there are problems with the uh, their favorite, uh, what I call sawed off uh, yardstick, the, you know, the uh, PCE deflator, uh, it way underweights housing, and it's not really a price index, it's a deflator anyway. But the point is, they're, they're so caught up in this mania about hitting an inflation target that they're ignoring what they're doing. I cited before, you know, that we've been basically in negative money market rates since uh, February 2008. The actual average real rate since February 2008 using this uh, CPI I've just cited is 135 basis points negative. Now, now that's 12 and a half years of negative money in real terms. Now, that's the reason why the stock market is off in one direction and, um, you know, the economy is struggling where it is today. Let me cite one more thing that I think uh, kind of capsulizes how serious this uh, bifurcation, this divergence has become. The most famous moment in time that you can benchmark uh, recently, and I mean not just the last few months, but in the last couple of decades is December 1996. And sure, uh, a lot of people remember what happened then. Alan Greenspan warned <laughs> that we were on the edge of irrational exuberance in the stock market, which was, you know, massively uh, lower than it is today. But in any event, he didn't do much about it, but he made the warning. Now, I, I bring that up as a benchmark because in the 23 years since then, the NASDAQ 100, which, I, you know, I think is the leading edge of the speculative mania in the financial markets, in the stock market uh, especially, that's been triggered since then. The NASDAQ 100 is up 1,450% in those 23 years. The nominal GDP is up 145% in those 23 years. In other words, the stock index has risen 10 times more than the economy uh, has grown. That's the disconnect, it's massive. And the problem is when you get into groupthink at the Fed, they completely ignore the, the real inflation, which is in financial assets, not you know consumer goods and services. And the market becomes so obsessed uh, with the, the movements and the smoke signals and the actions uh, of the central bank that they lose track of uh, the disconnect, as well as um, get caught up in a recency bias that is unbelievable. You still have people out there today come on Bubble Vision every morning and tell you the stock market isn't, over, isn't overvalued. Well, how in the hell could that be the case when on a real uh, basis it's trading at 50 times, uh, and that's the S&P, and uh, if you look at uh, the leading stocks uh, driving the uh, NASDAQ, a lot of them are far above that. So I think until you have a shock, the recency bias isn't going to go away. They'll just keep coming back to buy the dip as they are doing uh, day after day now. Uh, they tried to correct today, but it looks to me like, uh, well, they hit the 50-day moving average. So, okay, we must be okay. We'll buy it, the dip again tomorrow. This is the kind of mentality you have in the market. It's been totally ruined uh, as a result of this uh, insane central banking. And, and until uh, we get a shock, the central bankers aren't going to change. The market speculators are going to keep at it. And the uh, elected politicians are going to keep borrowing uh, until, uh, you know, some big thundering uh, crash uh, forces them all 
to stop uh, and wake up. I don't know how far away we are from that, but I would think one of these days it's uh, got to happen. All right. Well, I, I'd love to um, explore with you, you know, what you think some of the best prospects for a shock are, but I know I've got a very limited amount of time left. So a couple of quick questions. We'll definitely want to have you on again uh, in the future again, Dave, to dive into sure. more of some of the, the questions we're not going to be able to get into here. But um, we do have a pretty big election coming up uh, in, uh, what, uh, two months um, in November. Uh, and I'm just curious. Um, to the concerns that we're talking about with the economy and the markets, um, can you look at uh, your crystal ball and just think, you know, should Trump win? What implications would that have? And uh, similarly, if Biden wins, is there a different set of implications? Um, or do you think that uh, it's going to largely be status quo no matter who wins in November? Yeah, I think it's equally bad. Um, you know, Trump... <laughs> Uh, is, uh, you know, the most fiscally irresponsible president we've ever had. And, you know, he sort of piled on again yesterday saying, well, uh, if the bi moderates, so-called bipartisan uh, coalition moderates, want $1.5 trillion on top of the $3 trillion we've already had, uh, a bailout money, uh, more power to him, <laughs> that goes some more. You know, where is he coming from? Of course, the Democrats... Uh, you know, they don't have a clue. Uh, Trump thinks, uh, on balance, the Fed ought to go to $10 trillion of balance sheet or beyond. And as far as I can tell, some of the economic advisors uh, to Biden, uh, you know, are outright modern monetary theory uh, coops and cranks. So I don't think uh, any outcome we have is uh, going to be, uh, you know, constructive. But I do think, uh, you know, just getting to the sheer partisan politics in the intensity of what's going on today, you know, we'll, we may have a hung election uh, on not only election night, but for days and weeks beyond. And we may get to the uh, Electoral College meeting with, uh, you know, 500 dueling lawyers on both sides of the partisan divide contesting votes in precincts and counties in eight or 10 swing states that will determine the Electoral College. Now, I can't imagine how all of these uh, day traders and Robin Hooders uh, down on Wall Street are gonna think this doesn't matter and it'll be resolved and we'll just keep buying the dip. I think at some point they're gonna lose their nerve. And I think the Fed is already beginning to say, uh, you know, this was a supply side shock that brought the economy down. It's not a lack of demand. In fact, <laughs> I don't know if people have noticed, but uh, transfer payments at a run rate are now at six trillion when they've been running at three trillion before the COVID shock. So there's plenty of money out there. Uh, it's there's no production because so many sectors of the economy have been shut down or halfway uh, reopened or impaired in other ways. So I think even the Fed is beginning to say it's up to the fiscal process. Uh, we're, you know, burying ourselves in debt there, and we may not have an elected government that can do anything anyway uh, on the eve of uh, Christmas come the end of the year. So I think maybe the great shock uh, that will hopefully uh, bring the system uh, to its senses uh, is probably less than a few months away. God, that sounds like it would be a nightmare uh, if it happened, but um, it's certainly not discountable, and it's a bit scary that it's not discountable. Um, all right, well, David, so you, you've been, again, um, as I mentioned in the intro, you've been in the D.C. and Wall Street uh, orbits for pretty much your entire uh, professional career. Um, let's just say we magically made you president tomorrow or November, whenever. Um, are there any policies that would be on your short punch list uh, to deploy immediately to talk about some of the, you know, the, the deformations that we've been railing against here? Well, I, I think I should say I would demand a recount. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, tell them I'm not, you know, there, there's no uh, president, I think, that is uh, uh, capable of coping with this. But if I were, I would say I would put a front and center major political legislative drive on fixing the Fed. And in my view, that would take three things. One um, would be to abolish the open market committee and get them out of the, you know, uh, constant activist intervention in the financial markets. Let price discovery work. 
let interest rates be set by supply and demand for savings and uh, borrowed funds. Uh, the second thing uh, that I would do is uh, basically uh, unpack the current Fed. Get those people out of there. Demand the resignation of all of them. Start with a clean sheet of paper because they, they're all lifetime Fed people. For the most part, the uh, presidents of the regional Fed and half of the people on the uh, Federal Reserve Board have been in the system one, or Washington one way or another, including Powell, uh, most of their uh, life. Uh, so uh, I, I would uh, do that, and uh, I think if unless you get uh, the Fed, and I would third, and probably most importantly, uh, repeal the Humphrey Hawkins Act. There's no way in an $85 trillion economy worldwide that's as integrated and interconnected as this one is that a central bank in one country can micromanage the unemployment rate or the inflation rate. The numbers are flaky to begin with, and the tools to get to their so-called targets uh, are totally inadequate to the task. So the heart of the matter is Humphrey Hawkins has given what I call a monetary politburo, an elected uh, camarilla of, you know, uh, a dozen people, you know, power to manipulate financial prices, uh, financial asset prices, uh, that are pointless and that cannot possibly uh, improve the performance of the real economy. Now, you wouldn't do anything else. Uh, you wouldn't worry about programs. You wouldn't worry even about budgets. You would make it a referendum on why have we savaged tens of millions of savers and retirees? Why are we continually pushing for more inflation that erodes the purchasing power of workers who have to compete in a global labor market? Uh, and why are we uh, inflating financial assets, 55% of which are owned by the top 1% uh, and 85% by the top 10% of households? This should be getting you know, the people out with their pitchforks uh, and torches, as you said at the beginning, but if I were elected president, I would have the torches and pitchfork campaign focused a whole session, a special session of Congress on the Fed and uh, doing a fundamental uh, rewrite of their charter uh, and their remit. If, you, if, of course, that isn't going to happen because there's too many people that love the Fed, the Congress, because they can spend, Wall Street, because they can speculate. But uh, unless something as sweeping as that, as that gets done one of these days, I don't see how we get out of this uh, mess that we're in. All right. Um, I, I really appreciate you saying that, too, uh, everything you just said there, but, but right there at the end, um, because a theme that we've been mentioning on these uh, weekly videos is the, the Fed really sort of is at the headwaters of a lot of the um, certainly the injustice uh, and inequity that people are reacting to inside the country now. And um, one of the things we've been saying is, is until people are seeing the Fed as the villain in the story and not the hero, as they are currently cloaking themselves to be, and I think are still purported to be in the media and whatnot, um, you know, until we kind of have that moment where we can be honest about, you know, the nature of its role, um, you know, things aren't going to change I mean, up until a breaking point, like you've been saying. So um, it's great to hear, again, somebody with your august background, um, you know, putting a laser fine point uh, pinpoint on the Fed there as, as being the root cause of so much uh, damage and, uh, and, and really just, uh, you know, inequity. It's, uh, it's amazed me. You know, when you look at the stats, um, we've got a ton of baby boomers that have now you know, hit or passed retirement age, right? It's, I think the stat is still something like 10,000 a day, right? Yeah, right. And if you look at the median retirement savings that these people have, uh, it's a very scarily low number, right? I mean, it's like you know, low tens of thousands at best. Um, and I've seen ones that are even lower. And I always just wonder, when these people can't get any return on their savings, how the hell are these people making it in retirement? And why are there just legions of boomers out there, you know, marching in the streets uh, yet? And maybe at some point there will be. Um, but, but as I see it right now, one of the biggest things the Fed has done is just throw grandma under the bus and said, look, we're all about keeping asset prices high and moving higher, rewarding those that own financial assets. And if you don't have them or you're a saver, we don't care about you.
Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, they're telling grandma to uh, buy snowflake. Uh, yeah, or, at a hundred uh, times sale. <laughs> because if you uh, want to stay liquid, you're prudent, and you're elderly, and you have medical bills, and you have family considerations, you're not going to lock your money up in these uh, the long-term financial markets, and that's the only place to get a return. And all of that, and even that, is only temporary because one one of these days the whole uh, bubble uh, will come unwound. So that's the heart of the matter. There's three uh, villains in this piece: the Fed, the Fed, and the Fed. Uh, and until uh, we get some kind of recognition, but but here's the bad part: you got a president in the Republican so-called conservative party who thought the Fed was too uh, tough. Okay, uh, who has no clue that that's the real problem. And you, you now have a Republican Party that doesn't even recognize that the enemy of everything they allegedly stand for, free markets, uh, capitalist prosperity, uh, minimum government, uh, less uh, welfare, less transfer payments and all of that, that, all of that is being undermined by the Fed and, you know, for some reason, uh, there isn't uh, more than two people, maybe Rand Paul uh, and one or two others, that even have a clue that the massive rot in the center of the system is sitting right over there in the Eccles building uh, down the street uh, from Capitol Hill. All right. Well, David, uh, thank you so much. Again, I could keep you on for hours okay. here. And again, we look forward to bringing you back on again in the future. Um, uh, two questions for you. One is my true parting question, but I can't help shoehorning this other one in first because you mentioned a term earlier that I think many people really aren't familiar with or haven't heard in a long, long time. Um, so shoehorn question is um, bond vigilantes. Um, yeah. It played a role way back when you were you know, uh, a cabinet member, um, but we haven't seen them in decades really. And uh, I, I guess my question is, is uh, why, why can't they reemerge here? Why are they not you know, able to, to burst forth here and, and, and drive interest rates in this environment? Um, and keep that short because this is kind of, it's yeah. kind of a wonky question. Yeah. And then my last question is just, you know, to a, a, a viewer who's a concerned general investor, what would your general, you know, not specific personal financial advice, but your general advice be to today's concerned investor? Well, on the first one, the bond vigilantes went into hibernation in the early 1990s because the Greenspan Fed basically said, we're going to kill you uh, if you uh, pop your head up again. And that was pretty much de decided in 1994 when we had the last revolt, you know, that flare up in the bond market and the Fed panicked and opened up the spigots and we're off to the races ever since. But, uh, you know, as long as the Fed's buying up all the debt, uh, and that's what happened, you know, since March, the Fed has bought uh, and added $3 trillion to its balance sheet, and the government's borrowed $3 trillion in four months. So uh, as long as that happens, the bond vigilantes will stay in hibernation. But uh, either, therefore, uh, the Fed's going to stop and they'll come out in great, uh, you know, uh, militant uh, style because, you know, the, the deficit isn't going to go away next year or the year after. We're now in massive structural deficits, particularly because of the 10,000 per day retirees you talk about. But secondly, uh, given that outlook, what do you do? Well, I think this financial market has now been so falsified. It's been so massively inflated with speculation and uh, just, uh, you know, mindless uh, risk-taking and momentum chasing that it's dangerous to be there. But, you know, the 10-year the U.S. Treasury at 68 basis points, I think where it was today, is way, way overvalued. Don't own it. You're going to lose your shirt if you have to hold on to it indefinitely. The stock market is crazy, trading even at 27 times uh, the trailing uh, earnings that Wall Street uh, likes to pretend uh, actually happen. So you can't own stocks. You can't own bonds. Uh, I don't see any point in speculating in a lot of the commodities because I think the world economy is going to go into a long uh, slug of very little growth for a decade. So the thing to do is uh, buy gold early and often. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, <laughs> well, David, look, thanks so much for joining. Um, if people are interested in following you and your work, I know you have a website, you're on Twitter. Um, where can they go learn more about you? 
um, you know, I publish these kind of thoughts every day in what's called uh, David Stockton's Contra Corner. Um, and, you know, we cover the waterfront from politics in Washington to Wall Street to the Fed to the global economy and to matters of war and peace as well as, you know, prosperity and uh, its opposite. And, and you can find that uh, just by Googling uh, David Stockton's Contra Corner. Great. And we'll, we'll put the URL for your website up here or there where you're talking to. Um, all right. Well, David, look, thank you so much for the time, for the great insight you've shared. You've given me a lot to pivot and talk to uh, the lead partner, New Harbor Financial, about uh, John and Mike, uh, who have been here furiously taking notes while you've been talking. Uh, but we'll let you go, David. Uh, thanks again so much for giving us so much of your time on such a busy day. And we look forward to having you on the program again. Okay. Very good. Great to be with you. All right. So as I mentioned, we've got uh, the lead partners from New Harbor Financial. This is the financial advisory firm officially endorsed by Peak Prosperity. They join me every week to uh, look back at what the markets have done over the past seven days and to uh, suss out any important uh, developments that we see along the way. Mike, John, great to see you guys again. Hello, Adam. How are you doing? Always good to see you, uh, David, as well. Yeah, David was great. Yeah, Adam. Um, Mike, uh, I, I know you've met him in person before, but uh, boy, he's always great to see uh, hear his latest thoughts, correct? Yeah, we, John and I actually both met him, I think, a couple of years ago in New York City, and uh, he's fantastic. We always enjoy listening to David. He's got a unique way with words. He's, he's an insider in Washington, and um, he doesn't mind saying it like it is either. Yeah. Well, what I really appreciated about, you know, the – huge amount of uh, insight bombs that he dropped uh, there in his interview was it, it was very validative of uh, the points that we've been making, you know, week to week, month over month uh, on this program. And, uh, you know, not that we're trying to bring people in to create an echo chamber here. Uh, we're really not. We're trying to bring people here who have a unique insight into how different elements of the economy and the markets work. And as I said in my intro, there are a few people that kind of have the combination uh, between politics and economics that David does. Um, and it's, it is very validating. I think in some ways it's very scary. Um, I would love for him to have come in with a different opinion to say, guys, it's not as bad as you might be fearing. Uh, I think he actually maybe thinks things are a little bit more dire than even I do. Um, so anyways, you know, we're going to continue doing what we do week after week, which is to tell people, look, if you're trying to figure out what to do with your investment capital, with your financial wealth, uh, what do you do given what's happening in the markets? So guys, uh, last week, we saw that the markets had, um, uh, they were just uh, beginning to rebound from having uh, dropped by like six and a half percent about 10 days ago, uh, over a couple of days. Uh, the market, uh, I think it had a bounce and then it dropped uh, last Thursday. We were wondering if it was going to follow through. It didn't. Uh, the market found support. Uh, it bounced up a couple hundred S&P points. Uh, but then today seems to have given a lot of that back. So um, I, I think the shorthand from, from my perch is uh, markets kind of treading water here, trying to figure out which direction it's going to go, whether you know it's going to return to uh, climbing higher or whether we might have seen the top two weeks back. And it's just, you know, we're in that period where it's struggling to get higher, will at some point fail and then begin dropping. Um, so Jets, uh, do you have a different read on it? Uh, and if so, what is it? And if not, uh, what are you looking at right now? Um, John, why don't we start with you? Yeah, Adam, thanks. Um, yeah, no, a lot of, you know, kind of going nowhere in, in the last week or so, you know, a couple of twos and fro's, but I think it's pretty remarkable. We had the Federal Reserve come out yesterday, um, basically saying without a shadow of doubt, we're not going to raise interest rates uh, until 2023 at the earliest, um, which, you know, is, is just an amazing thing to, to hear. Certainly 10 years ago, if you heard that, it would have been like, you know, what the heck? Um, but now it seems to be not enough. You know, the markets seem to not, uh, at least so far, seem to think that's not quite dovish or, or accommodative enough, um, which is just remarkable in its own own right. Um, but yeah, I mean, we um, we saw a pretty, pretty uh, you, know, uh, you know, big down sell yesterday. It rallied into the close a little bit and again today. Um, but, um, you know, I think we're, we're marking out some some pretty, Pretty typical topping patterns here, but you know, time will only tell. All right, Mike, how about on your end? Anything you're catching in addition to, to what John's seeing, you see about the same? Uh, pretty much the same, Adam. I mean, this market's somewhat range bound. Yeah, we were down 6%. We bounced this week early on. 
you know, today we recovered half the losses into the close on your typical kind of last hour ramp. But you know, I'm looking at a chart right now. We're actually up on the week by about 10 or 15 S&P points at 33.50. David Stockman mentioned how we bounced off the 50-day moving average. Um, we're kind of bouncing along a support shelf here, you know, 3,300, 3,350. The market is tracing out a typical topping pattern, but the market's nothing like typical, right? I mean, David mentioned it's about the Fed, the Fed, and the Fed. So who knows? But it, to us, it looks vulnerable here. It looks like it wants to roll over, break through this support shelf, and, and go down to 3,200 in, in pretty quick fashion. But you know, that's to us, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, this market could easily lose and probably should lose over the next couple of years, more than 50%, maybe 60 plus percent. You know, the market would have to be in the low teens on the S&P. It would have to be down 60, 65% just to be back towards middle of the road valuations. And here we are in, a, in an economy, you know, we don't know what's, what it's look like, what it's going to look like going forward. Behaviors have changed, you know, small businesses are closing, restaurants are closing. We're at the end, we think, of this monetary experiment. It's hard to overstate just how distorted things have gotten with the, the Federal Reserve and how lazy kind of we've all gotten in the public with just expecting the market to always go up. So, you know, David used some kind words. Uh, we think the market's broken. It's been broken for a long time. And although we don't like to say we're praying and hoping for a bad outcome, that shock that David talked about actually does need to happen. For there to be some justice in the system, you know, and, and frankly, even some freedom in the markets that would allow us to have potentially better times ahead economically and in, in a bigger way in life. So, you know, those are my words. Now, I guess I'll stop there. All right. Um, just a couple of data points to add on to what you said there, Mike. Those are great points. Um, when I think Yelp just came out and said that 60% of the businesses that have been temporarily closed. Um, it now calculates as being permanently closed, meaning that they're just never going to reopen um, uh, once uh, you know lockdowns are fully lifted and, and whatnot. Um, and uh, it, you know that, that that's got to be treading towards sort of that shock moment that we're talking about, where you're having big chunks of the economy like that uh, just not come back, right? Um, so uh, there's that data point. I'm going to put up a chart here. Um, this is talking very similarly to what uh, David was saying earlier. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the NASDAQ versus uh, GDP growth, where the, the NASDAQ's growing, NASDAQ 100 was growing 10 times faster than GDP, which we just know can't continue forever. Um, this is a, a, a chart of uh, the Fed's uh, interest rates uh, against the NASDAQ. Uh, so it's a similar chart, not exactly what David was talking about, but similar. Um, and what it shows basically is, is the serial bubble blowing nature of the Fed where Fed had interest rates too low, it created an initial bubble, which was the, the dot-com bubble. Uh, that burst, so they brought rates, rates down even lower. That created a second bubble, the housing bubble, right? So what do they do? Well, they brought rates down lower and held them lower for longer, and that has created the, the everything bubble that we see ourselves in here today. And, uh, and, and you, you can see that, you know, if you map that interest rate uh, trajectory over at the NASDAQ, yeah, the NASDAQ uh, has had, uh, you know, some major bubbles and, and where the territory it's in now is just historically, you know, unprecedented by a huge factor. And what's interesting is this, this chart, this chart does mention certain, um, you know, fed, uh, statements and whatnot. Uh, I'm, I'm referring specifically to the watching paint dry quote from, uh, Janet Yellen's because what's interesting about the chart is it talks about two things. One, it, it, it talks about, um, uh, you know, the Fed uh, saying, look, we want to get inflation under control. Uh, and of course, the Fed has always been chasing inflation and never able to hit their inflation goals, as David Stockman was saying. We think they're misguided, but it basically says they're never hitting their goals, right? Secondly, they say uh, every single time that they increased their balance sheets, they said it was temporary. And Janet's famous watching paint dry quote was, hey, you know, we've, we've had to expand this balance sheet because of the great financial crisis, but we're definitely going to bring it back down to where it was before. And my gosh, it's going to be such a non-event. It's going to be so boring. It's going to be like watching paint dry. Uh, and of course, you know, Bernanke did nothing to bring them, uh, the balance sheet down. Yellen did nothing to bring the balance sheet down. Powell tried for a couple of months, the market threw a hissy fit, and he just did a complete 180 reversal, and it's been off to the races ever since. Um, and so, you know, I think a huge part of what David Stockman was saying is, is you know, these guys at the Fed um, are very misguided 
Um, but they're also kind of like, you know, shame on us, right? We've got a huge record of these guys telling us what they're planning to do, them missing their goals and targets, and yet we still continue to listen to these guys. So anyways, sorry for the dry tri diatribe there. Um, I was happy to see David, you know, basically in a nutshell say, hey, look, in this market, there's not a hell of a lot you can do. The only thing that looks halfway decent to me is owning some gold. And while you guys at New Harbor are uh, very defensively positioned, you're, you are heavily in cash for lack of many better options. Where you are invested, you are largely invested in the precious metal space, right? Both bullion and miners. Um, John, that, that is still true, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And, uh, you know, we uh, are, are, besides that, we're, we're pretty much net flat or zero exposure to the stock market. We, we actually have a slight short or inverse exposure to U.S. stock markets, which are categorically the most overvalued of any markets on the planet. But we have that paired off with roughly an equivalent amount of positive or long exposure to foreign emerging market stocks, which we have hedges on as well. So, so net net, we're about 0% in the broad stock market. We do have, you know, 10, 15% or so in gold mining stock exposure for folks, which, which categorically are you know, pretty reasonably, if not undervalued uh, stocks, if you look at their, their fundamentals. Um, and certainly if gold prices continue higher, they'll become even more so a compelling uh, valuation and, and, and purchase in our view. Yeah, and um, in theory, at least, the Fed declaring that it's going to hold rates at zero for the next, you know, three plus years um, should be bullish for gold, right? It should be giving gold a green light to be. Yeah, to be I mean, absolutely. I mean, even simplistically, when you're when you're running negative real interest rates like we are now and have been for as long as we can remember, um, you know, one of the big arguments against gold, at least by the mainstream um, analysts, is that it pays no yield, right? So. When you've got negative real yield, well, guess what? You can take that argument right off the table because uh, having no yield has no, no. of course, that's not why, why we own precious metals or why most people own physical metals. It's not, um, you know, because it's a, you know, uh, it's, it's an, un an investment, uh, yes, but it's, it's more so an insurance policy against some of the ridiculous um, monetary policies we keep seeing spun out. And um, yeah, you know, to the point of, you know, shame on us, Adam, you know, shame on us, not only because of the, the repeated failures of the Fed, but they have consistently moved the goalposts. You know, when you think about the, you know, QE1 and TARP and all that stuff, you know, the, the, the metric they were using as, hey, we're going to unwind this uh, massive never be fun done before program was, hey, once we get the unemployment rate down below, I think 6% was the first target. Right. And guess what? They reached that. And uh, you know what? Well, we're going to wait for 5%. You know what? When they reach that, we're going to start talking about inflation rates. You know, so it was a consistently sloppy moving target, almost like either they had no plan or they had a, plan, a bigger plan and they were lying through their teeth. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, if, if you stitch together the, the narrative, it's, it, it is indeed shame on us. Yeah, sinister or incompetent. It's almost hard to know which one would be worse in this case. Um, all right, Mike, I'm going to let you have the last word here. Um, my, my general question for you is, um, you know, I, I, I talked to you guys in between these meetings. I know you guys um, are, A, having, I think, one of your better years ever uh, in terms of portfolio return at New Harbor, so congratulations. But um, I know you still have a lot of people that are calling you up, um, you know, asking questions in this environment. Um, you know, what are the types of concerns, questions, issues that, that people are calling you with right now? You know, are people feeling, uh, you know, uh, put at ease that the, the market has recovered slightly from the drop and feeling a little bit more, you know, comfortable being bullish? Or are you seeing people still, you know, really being suspicious of these markets and not wanting to be the, greater, the last greatest fool who goes long just to lose a good chunk of their wealth when the next downdraft comes? Yeah, um, about your comment about being up this year, we are up high single digits this year uh, because of our exposure to, to metals um, in mining shares. There's been quite a uh, you know, nice move in that group this year, and certainly that has benefited our portfolio. We have been you know, pretty much net out of the stock market all year, except for a little bit of nibbling we did on the, on the March decline. We, we added maybe 1% to 2% for, for most accounts during that time. But we are back to flat or 0% or net the stock market with uh, most of our fluctuations coming day to day from what, what are, what's happening to uh, metals and mining shares. But we're talking to a lot of new people and we're very grateful uh, to have that opportunity. And um, I can only speak for the conversations I'm having. It's a pretty consistent 
theme of uh, you know, people just not really knowing what to do with cash. Most of the people are, not all, but most of them that I've talked to are very heavily in cash or cash equivalents. Um, Many people already have some exposure to gold and silver physical bullion. If they don't, we're helping them figure out how to do that and why they should do it. Um, but you know, people are afraid. They're, they're worried about you know what happens if we go straight into hyperinflation. It's possible. We personally think that deflation is probably more likely short term, and that's what the Fed is trying to fight off. If you look at the velocity of money, it's just completely cratered while the, the money supply has exploded upwards. But what to do with money? You know, we, we, we're still telling people the same old boring things. If you're overexposed to equities, reduce that exposure. Get down to below one third or 30% equities at least. Consider paying off debt, simplifying your life. Um, over and above that, uh, hold really short term guaranteed cash or treasury bills. It's the biggest component of our portfolio, treasury bills. And um, you know, I mentioned the physical bullion exposure. We, we could be wrong. Maybe we do go straight into hyperinflation, but that's where tangible assets come in. You know, get some exposure, 5 to 20%, let's say, in gold and silver. And, um, you know, keep your powder dry for what is likely to be better prices in the stock market and in the real estate market in the years ahead. That's the deflationary force that we're talking about. So, yeah, people just want to have guidance and confidence to get out of stocks if they're not already, but that's less than probably one third of the people we're talking to. And people are just afraid and, you know, they want to know where to, where to hold their cash and, you know, we're there to help them tell them treasury bills, either we can help them or they could use treasury direct or something like that. And uh, someday, someday we'll get an opportunity. That thing that David Stockman's talking about, a shock to the system. It'd be a good thing because right now we have an absolute psychological, you know, war game going on, you know, trying to get people to feel really uncomfortable about doing anything but staying in the stock market. And that's not right. So our job is to help them feel confident about that. And we're happy to have all the conversations that we're, we're so grateful to have. Great. Well, we're so grateful that you're there to have those conversations. Though you said people were reaching out still fairly afraid about things. I'm not sure that David's comments uh, earlier in this interview did much to, <laughs> to calm them, probably probably yeah. fun them up a little bit more. Um, all right, folks, well, we're at the end of our time here. Um, so Mike and John, right before we conclude, I've got a, a few housekeeping tips that I keep forgetting to mention. So I'm going to dial through them here real quickly. So if you're still watching, there's three things I'd, uh, I'd urge you guys to do. Uh, the first is if, if interested, follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Menlo Bear. And uh, the reason why I, I'm telling you to follow me there is, um, you know, I share a fair amount of the insights that, that we put together during the week at Peak Prosperity, but it's a really good channel for a learning about who's going to be on the program next week on this market update program. But also I'm always soliciting input on who people would like to see as future guest experts. So if you have feedback, I'd love for you to send it to me. Twitter is the best way to do that. Um, secondly, um, if you haven't heard about it yet, um, the peak prosperity annual seminar is going to be held this year. We didn't let COVID beat us. Um, we're bringing it digital for the first time ever. It's an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, we're going to have folks, many of which that you've seen briefly on this program, folks like Danielle DiMartino Booth, uh, Mike Maloney, uh, Sven Henrik, um, hopefully Grant Williams um, committed. We know we've got uh, John Rubino, Wolf Richter, Axel Merck. We've got energy experts like Art Berman and uh, Richard Heinberg and Gail Ferberg. We've got uh, other resource specialists like uh, America's Farmer, Joel Salatin, and, and a bunch of other uh, experts in building resilience into your life in terms of your money, your home, your health, your community. Uh, it's going to be amazing. If you want to learn more about it, go to peakprosperity.com slash seminar 2020. Um, and uh, there's early bird pricing. So if you think you're interested, go check it out soon just so you can get the early bird pricing. Um, and then last, um, a quick little parable. I went to the dentist yesterday. Um, and I've got pretty good teeth, um, but they did a, an x-ray. Um, and uh, in the x-ray, they found the very beginning of a little bit of, of tooth decay back. I've still got my wisdom teeth, so back there. Uh, and it was so faint that they, they didn't detect it when they did sort of the manual inspection, but the x-ray um, revealed it. And so if you're thinking about, um, you know, how to preserve your wealth and, and whatnot, highly recommend you get a portfolio x-ray. And, you know, we've been saying in past videos here, Find a financial advisor who appreciates the risks we talk about here. Uh, have them take a look at your financial situation and give you input as to whether you're well positioned if some of these uh, 
shocks and other types of things that we're, we're warning about here on the program were to happen. So if you've got somebody who can do that for you, great, stick with them. If you don't, uh, that's a service that John and Mike provide for free. It's something that we've worked out uh, you know, between Peak Prosperity and New Harbor. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no requirement to work with them. It's just a complete public service we do because we want people to preserve capital in this crazy environment. If you're interested in that, just stick around to the end of the, the video here. We've got all the instructions for how to do that. Uh, John and Mike, great having you guys here again this week. Thanks for chugging along one extra additional week in this crazy saga. It'll be interesting to see what happens next week, but we'll keep our fingers crossed that some of the, uh, the air out of the balloon that would make things a little bit saner happens sooner rather than later. Um, and look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks for having us, Adam. Good to see you again. We'll be here, Adam. We look forward to it. All right. Have a great week, guys. I'll see you later. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to graylockpeak.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given the latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Peak Prosperity has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. Chris and I started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration and are looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or just downright ridiculed by the standard sort of financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type, the kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market's always going to take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing which is why we strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you'll work with, just as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you aren't, or you're having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. And for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Peak Prosperity and New Harbor, which we had to put in place to make sure that everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the graylockpeak.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to graylockpeak.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.